our first speaker will be uh, Meng Su, who is a first year Papillardo Fellow, having joined us from Harvard University. He works in astrophysics and will give us a presentation on the gamma ray sky. And I'm not sure whether the goggles are included. <laughs> Can you hear me? OK, great. Thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, uh, as the first speaker, I would like to thank Neil and Jane for this wonderful fellowship. And it's my, really my great pleasure to be one of the new Power Leader Fellows here at MIT and have this great opportunity to share with you some uh, uh, surprising discoveries we made recently when you look at the sky with our gamma eye. So my host here is Professor Max Techmark. Um, so mostly I identify myself as an astrophysicist. I'm interested in studying the universe in general based on what we see from the sky and what we know about physics. I'm not too ambitious today to tell you everything I work on, uh, ranging from theories of the very early universe to experiment at South Pole in Antarctica. But I, hope to, I do hope to cover two stories of my research today, uh, focused on studying the Milky Way or home galaxy. So in some cases, astrophysicists are applying physics we know to study uh, phenomena in the universe that don't, we don't know well. Uh, for, uh, in the following, the first example I'm going to show you is that we make a discovery and try to understand it with no physics. But in some other cases, we do hope that observations from the sky can teach us something about the fundamental physics. There are a few great examples like the discovery of dark energy, which composes about 70% of our whole uh, universe. But I'm, today I'm going to give you another example. So uh, we have a chance to get out of the city and look at the sky. You might see this beautiful structure, which is a Milky Way, our home galaxy. It contains about a hundred billions of stars. It's like a disk. Uh, it's a disk-like galaxy, and you see uh, close by uh, bright stars like this. But for most of the stars, our human eyes are just not good enough to resolve every star. So you just see like a silk uh, band on the sky. That's how the galaxy got this uh, very lovely name, Milky Way. Um, so uh, outside the realm of the human vision, it is the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, our visible light is only a small, tiny piece of the whole spectrum. So the spectrum range from very low frequency, uh, long wavelengths, uh, we call it radio uh, wavelengths, to very high energy uh, uh, pho photons, we call it gamma ray photons. And each wavelength reveals something unique about our universe. So gamma ray photons are the highest energy photons you see from the universe. So here is one example, what our Milky Way look like. Uh, across a whole electromagnetic spectrum. So range from uh, radio wavelengths, which means uh, lower uh, energy and uh, longer wavelengths, to very high energy gamma ray maps. So each panel shows you the disk of the Milky Way. So just to remind you that one photon from this gamma ray map is equivalent to 10 to the 15 photons from the radio map. So it's a very dynamic range. So unfortunately, gamma ray photons are not uh, uh, opaque to Earth's atmosphere. So in order to receive photons from the sky directly, we have to go out to space. I'm going to present results using data from Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. It's a, so here's an image of Fermi before launch. You can see the detector here sitting on top of the uh, Delta II Heavy rocket uh, with half of the fearing in place. So to, to give you a better idea, so you can see two persons uh, sitting, uh, standing over there uh, working on the rocket. So as you might have guessed, uh, this telescope was named in honor of uh, Enrico Fermi, who not only led the famous Manhattan Project, but also he pioneered the theory to explain how charged particles being accelerated in the astronomical environment. So, you, so here is a fine structure constant formula wrote by Fermi on the blackboard. You might already notice the sense of humor Fermi had. He flipped the reduced uh, Planck constant with the uh, charge, <laughs> electron charge, uh, just, uh, just for fun. Anyway, <laughs> Ten, uh, so Fermi nine, launched almost five eight, years ago, uh, seven, back to uh, June six, 2008. Five. That's too long. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, the, the major instrument of Fermi is called Large te Area Telescope uh, on top. Um, so gamma rays are so energetic, uh, you cannot deflect those photons by mirrors and lenses as you, as you, you already imagine with a uh, 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 typical telescope. So it's more like a, a particle detector. When you have a gamma ray photons coming from the sky, hit the de detector, so the photon will be uh, colliding with uh, tungsten, layers of tungsten, and uh, convert to electrons and positron pairs. 
So the detector will measure the trajectory of the uh, electron and the positron pairs and reconstruct where the uh, gamma ray photon is coming from, uh, from the sky. So the whole energy of the uh, photon being mirrored with a calorimeter at the bottom. Just to remind you that uh, the photons we receive with human's eye is about two to three electron volts. But the photons uh, detected by Fermi telescope is much higher. It's within about 20, uh, sorry, 20 million uh, electron volts to 300 billion electron volts. So with data from Fermi gamma ray space telescope, I led the research uh, to study the diffuse gamma ray emission from our Milky Way in general. And in this paper, we discovered a surprising gigantic pair of gamma ray bubbles on the sky. So this cartoon picture just show you the basic structure of the bubbles from a point of view outside the Milky Way. So you can see the center of the galaxy is here and the plane of the Milky Way. Our solar system is sitting here, roughly about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And each bubble is about the same size as the distance from the, our solar system to the center of the galaxy. So if you, that means if you look at the sky, the whole a pair of the bubbles are crossing more than half of the visible sky. So that's, besides of the uh, disk, this is like the biggest structure ever been discovered in our Milky Way. So after we published the, uh, our discovery paper, uh, NASA did a press release for us and uh, uh, at that time, we were using one and a half year data from Fermi. Uh, we named the structure uh, Fermi bubbles uh, to, because we used the instrument uh, of, uh, of Fermi Gamma Space Telescope. So the, here is real data look like the a pair of bubbles appearing rise and down from the center of the galaxy. So that, that's how it's being discovered. So very roughly, so we made the gamma ray uh, sky using Fermi data first and restructured the uh, stretch a little bit and removed point sources which also shine gamma rays and restretch the uh, stretch again and reveal the bubbles. So uh, here is just an uh, uh, animation showing you the pair of bubbles relative to something like our Milky Way, a spiral galaxy. Although the, the, the si size of the bubbles is pretty huge, the age of the bubble may be only a few million years. So we believe that gamma rays photons are from the bubble are coming from very high energy electrons interacting with low energy photons. So it could, those, uh, the so source of those electrons are, are still unknown. So it could be from uh, massive star formation from the center of the galaxy or could be from uh, uh, eruptions of uh, a, a supermassive black hole sitting in the center of the galaxy. Okay, so Fermi is still taking data. This is a fresh image I made this morning using data from the starting of the mission uh, up to practically right now. So you see the beautiful bubble structures and with more and more data, we, start, we can start to think about uh, substructures within the bubbles, try to reveal the physical origin uh, more carefully. So the center of the galaxy is, is here and the galaxy plane is over there. So in, uh, in the following, I might use uh, FB for short to stand for Fermi bubbles but I uh, understand that some of you use FB for something else, for example, Facebook. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, right after we published our discovery and the, 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 the story goes into news quite quickly. So this is the front page of uh, New York Times and our bubble is on top of the science news and many other things going on. It's being selected as top 10 physics news by uh, American Physical Society and being called best cosmic mind blowers uh, by uh, na uh, Natural uh, Geographic. Uh, the reason I'm talking about that is uh, right after those news showing up on the web, I start to receive emails by, from people saying that, oh, that's great, you guys are amazing, you found aliens. At that time I was, uh, I, I, di I didn't figure out what's going on, and, uh, but I didn't realize that at this situation, you might want to Google it. So this is what I found. So suppose some, some kind of advanced civilization somewhere in the cosmos is already capable of using all the energies from its nearby star. It's, it's on the way to explore uh, p powers of the whole galaxy. So you would pre presumably find a, a, a visible, a, a void of hosts uh, from visible light. Uh, so this kind of structure being, being named, sometimes being called Fermi bubble. Uh, people actually use this technique to try to find aliens. So the story we learned is that never invent a new name without Google it first. <laughs> so uh, good news is that uh, Planck satellite recently confirmed the, the discovery of Fermi bubbles from a uh, gamma ray uh, telescope. So this, uh, as, uh, as Max just mentioned, the, the Planck satellite is so fantastic and teaches us many things about the cos cosmology. But one thing we learned from Planck also is that 
uh, you see there's kind of some kind of residual emissions from the center of the galaxy in general. And if I overlay this picture with the gamma ray bubbles in blue, you can see those uh, morphology are quite similar. Okay, so I mentioned that one possible way to produce the bubbles is through the supermassive black hole sitting in the center of the galaxy. So we knew that black holes can accelerate particles to very high energy and shoot relativistic narrow beams. So uh, here's a cartoon picture showing, that, uh, showing our recent work uh, uh, that we found evidence for this kind of collimated, very energetic jet in our Milky Way, shooting right, right through the center of the galaxy to the edge of the bubbles. That could be the first evidence that our black hole was so active in the past. And if it's been confirmed, it will be the first uh, spatially resolved gamma ray jet from the sky. Okay, as a Papalado fellow, I will use multi-wave observations to probe the nature of the uh, Fermi bubbles, use observations ranging from radio, optical, x-ray to gamma rays. Uh, so the gigantic bubbles are not only the surprises we found from the gamma ray sky. Please let me start with this pie chart, this famous pie chart of the components of the universe. So we know that roughly speaking, 70% of your universe is made of so-called dark energy. It's responsible, this component is responsible for the acceleration of the current universe. On the other hand, about 25% of the universe is made of dark matter. So we call it dark because we want to distinguish it from the ordinary matter. And the, the matters contained the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the periodic table is only about, I mean, less than 5% 5, 5 of the whole universe which is even lower than the sales tax rate of Massachusetts. Um, we know that dark matter exists in our universe, or at least a movie called Dark Matter, made by human beings, exists. So the concept of dark matter was invented by this gentleman here, uh, Fritz Ricci, uh, back to 1933. He noticed that uh, the random velocity of uh, galaxies in a cluster of galaxies like this is too high. It's higher than it should be. Uh, if there's no invisible matter, provide additional gravitational force, those galaxies will just fall, in, fall, fall apart, uh, would not be gravitationally bounded. So in the last couple of decades, people realized that the evidence of dark matter exists everywhere, ranging from the galactic scale to cosmological scale. As always, we never run short of candidates. We have a huge list of what dark matter could be, uh, theoretically, but nature could be much more smarter than us. Uh, uh, so the first question, or may, the, may, yeah, maybe the first question we want to ask is whether dark matter has a particle nature. If it's not, uh, if it does, what's the nature, uh, what, what's the property of the, uh, the particle? If it's not, what's something else? So if dark matter has a particle nature, the particle, uh, dark matter particle and its antiparticle in principle can collide, annihilate, and produce standard model particles like quarks, leptons, bosons that we're familiar with. And some of those particles are not stable. Eventually, they will turn into stable particles like positrons, electrons, protons, antiprotons, things like that. Um, however, charged particles are not only being produced by dark matter, there are also astrophysical processes can produce charged particles like very energetic pulsars and the explosion of stars uh, like supernova remnant. So the good thing is that uh, uh, gamma ray photons also being produced by dark matter annihilation. So th because photons almost to a very good approximation, photons travel uh, from the center of the galaxy to us in a relatively straight line. So like, un unlike charged particles, which would be in principle deflected by uh, magnetic field existing in our Milky Way, so we can observe the gamma rays from the sky, and which still keeps the spatial information, so we know where the dark matter is. So dark matter basically follows the gravity, uh, uh, gravitational law, so where you have deeper gravitational p potential, you expect to have more uh, 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 higher dan uh, density of dark matter particles, so you can expect to have higher chance to see dark matter annihilation signatures. So to make uh, dark matter signal more uh, clear, in, uh, uh, onto gamma ray. So imagine that if dark matter particle can interact and produce two photons due to very simple energy and the momentum conservation, uh, the energy of the photons you receive from the sky is the same as the, uh, as the mass of the dark matter particle. So 
presumably you would expect to see a mono-energetic gamma-ray photon lights from the sky. However, your uh, experiment, your instrument is not perfect. Uh, the, the, the single mono-energetic energetic line would be smeared by the uh, instrument resolution. So what you should see from the sky is something like this. Uh, access a bump on top of some diffuse uh, background. So because astrophysical processes is very hard to produce a line-like feature in gamma ray, we always call this kind of signature as a smoking gun for dark matter, and, uh, for dark matter particle. So this is from simulation, and this is what real data look like. So uh, this plot is uh, borrowed from our recent paper. So the x-axis is the energy increasing to, to the right, and the y-axis is the intensity of gamma ray photons. So on top of something like a uh, diffuse background, you see kind of an uh, axis uh, around uh, energy about 130 billion electron volts. So uh, just give you an idea where those gamma ray line photons come from. So here is a full sky map at around 130 billion electron volts. So you see most of the sky is consistent with noise, but there is an axis right from the center of the galaxy where you expect, expect to see the strongest dark matter uh, signal. So uh, this signal uh, up to now is uh, uh, not strong enough to claim a discovery, uh, but in the uh, next few years, Fermi will keep serving the uh, sky and taking more data. We actually just propose that Fermi can change how they look at the sky and accumulate more data from the center of the galaxy. If the line is real, uh, we expect that several other instruments uh, in the next few years would confirm this signal. If it's been confirmed, it will be the first strong indication that dark matter has a particle nature and its mass is about 130 billion electron volts. So just to show you that the center of the galaxy is here. Okay, so besides studying the, universe, uh, the, the uh, Milky Way, I'm also using various techniques to study uh, the dynamical history and the thermal history of our universe. So after the Big Bang, uh, the universe was getting cooler and cooler, and structures uh, like uh, nucleus, atoms, uh, stars, and galaxies are started, were starting to form. So based on how the, these structures being formed and evolved, we can learn something about uh, dark matter and dark energy. So we have been uh, in a very exciting time of the, uh, uh, how we understand the universe in the last couple of decades, or knowledge of the universe being revolution, revolutionized, and we keep learning that our universe is full of surprises. So uh, with better and better observations, we can actually start to measure precisely those parameters of the universe, like Max has mentioned. The age of the universe is about 13.7 or 13.8 now billion years. So there's a top popular singer uh, in England, Katie Malua. She uh, had a beautiful song called Nine Million Bicycles in Beijing. Uh, it's a love story about how she loved a, a guy compared to nine million bicycles, so on and so forth. And uh, she has this beautiful uh, passage here. I hope it works. We are 12 billion light years from the edge. That's a guess. No one can ever say it's true. But I know that I will always be with you. Okay, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 12 billion years, uh, that's pretty close. However, uh, particle physicist, Simon Singh, uh, who used every chance to promote good science, and uh, he wrote to Malua uh, for inaccurate referring the size of the observable universe. Uh, he said, oh, we know our universe is 13.7 billion years. It's pretty, it's, it's, although it's not absolutely true, it's pretty close to being true uh, with decent error bars. So uh, to his credit, Malua uh, called him back and said, oh, sorry, I'm so embarrassed. I was, uh, in a number, uh, was a member of astronomy club, and uh, I should know that better. So actually, she recut the song, and I would like to end with this new version. We are 13.7 billion miles from the edge of the observable universe. That's a good estimate with well-defined error And with the available information, I predict that I will always be how cool is that? Thank you so much.
Thank you. Enlightening. Um, my wife, of course, is a music major. She oh. appreciates the maybe, ending maybe especially. Maybe Jay already know this song. <laughs> what I don't understand, since we are off to the right in this image of the Fermi bubbles, how, are we looking at gamma rays directly, or were you looking at the effect of gamma rays hitting other things and receiving it? Because I don't see how, since they seem to be very directional, mm -hmm. how we could see them from where we are sitting. So uh, gamma ray photons are produ produced by uh, uh, interacting of very high energy electrons with photon uh, from the environment. So although the structure is so directed, but the photons can produce to add, I mean, to add everywhere. So uh, you can sit in any place in the universe and look at the bubble with different morphology. So we're actually look, taking um, gamma ray photons from the bubble, just uh, scattering to, to the direction to, to Earth. Oh, you're welcome. That, that was question. a really good question. <laughs> Well, that was a really good question. Directly yeah. at the center of the galaxy, I can see because those are coming yeah. directly towards you. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Is it yeah. glowing or is it or is it scattering? Very, very good question. Are there yes. other, are there other good questions waiting to be asked? Of course. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Are, uh, is there any evidence for this type of structure in other galaxies? In other galaxies, galaxies? yeah, exactly. Uh, that that's a very good question. <laughs> so we do find uh, bubble-like structures. Uh, we, we didn't design the question. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so we, we did see uh, structures, I mean, bubble-like structures in other galaxies, or even galaxy clusters, but not in gamma ray, uh, uh, ranging from radio optical, I mean, some other wavelengths. Because Fermi, actually, the first gamma ray telescope have enough spatial resolution and sensitivity to de detect those stuff. I mean, even the bubble is general in any Milky Way-like galaxies, we're still are not, not able to find those things in gamma rays. But it's a very good point that if we can make a link between gamma ray bubbles, like in your Milky Way, we will link the Fermi bubble with other uh, wavelength observations. By looking at other wavelengths, we can infer what the gamma ray structure, like bubbles or all those things like that, in other galaxies. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, Andre, go ahead. What's special about gamma rays? I mean. It, is it the bubble that's important, or is it the fact that it's a gamma ray bubble? It's a gamma ray bubble. Is mm, let me see about how to answer that question. I mean, bubble itself is important because uh, produce the producing this uh, structure means it has something special need to happen to the very inner of the galaxy. So by producing these bubbles, um, like cosmic ray electrons, very. Uh, Energetic electrons, like fill up the stuff and produce whatever emissions, like in gamma, gamma ray or microwave, as I just showed, like the Planck uh, satellite uh, scene from the sky. So the physical structure itself is meaningful that you can learn something about the, the very energetic thing for, happened from the center of the galaxy in the way past. Sounds like all of the above. <laughs> yes. Jet off axis with the bubble. I'm sorry. Why, why is the jet off axis with the Oh, that's bubble? also a good, great question. Um, so as you can see, the jet is so collimated. It's a very, very narrow jet. And by itself, it might be very hard to, to, to generate the, the bubble like that, uh, white and uh, kind of uniform. But we expect that if the, the, if the jet implies that the, the, the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy was so active, eat, actively eating material, and uh, uh, you know, produce very high energy uh, particles. Then some kind of uh, shock can going on and produce the bubble. And I mean, the the same activity can produce both the jet and the bubble, but not necessarily the jet itself can produce a whole bubble. So the the offset of the jet is not necessarily imply that. Um, I mean, the jet is no has no relation with the bubbles. I think that said we don't know, but I, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> I hope to answer that somehow. Uh, so I understood that you said that this resulted from some event that occurred in the past and that you know how long ago it was. How, how, is, it, how is the time scale hey, determined? That's a very great question. So <laughs> thanks. Um, so we see gamma rays uh, from within the bubble. Uh, we interpret that. Uh, those gamma rays are coming from interacting of very high energy electrons 
uh, upper scattering low energy photons. But something need to keep those high energy uh, electrons fooling around of, of, uh, within the bubbles. So the cooling time, I mean, um, high energy electrons uh, keep losing their energy within the bubbles. So we estimate that the time scale and, and the life time scale of those electrons about 10 million years. So you see the gamma rays still from within the bubbles. That means the age of those electrons are, must be younger than 10 million years. Unless something else keep accelerating those particles, we know the age of the bubble must be younger than 10 million years. It's young. Walter. So you made a connection uh, with the dark matter. Yeah. There are two things that I don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. Number one, we know that the distribution of dark matter in our galaxy yes. is very, very different from what you showed us. That's my first point. Uh -huh. My second point is, if this really were a signature of the dark matter, uh -huh. which fraction of the dark matter that we know has to exist have you explained? Yes, that's also a very great question. So let me back to the <laughs> spatial morphology of the line photons. So this is actually the very peak of where the dark matter, I mean, dark matter profile uh, from numerical simulations, I mean, we, we can't actually observe what, what the distribution of dark matter, but the, the dark matter distribution profile predicted from numerical simulations has some kind of a peak in the center and a broad tail uh, from the inner galaxy. So actually, if, you, if we, uh, we actually fit the dis distribution of this uh, line photons with the distribution of dark matter profile predicted from numerical simulations, which actually, of the, profile. the square of the profile, yes. Because it's the interaction. Exactly, profile. yeah, the square of the profile. So actually the, the distribution of photons is pretty consistent. I actually prefer the inferred uh, dark matter profile from the micro simulations. Um, so that, that's a great question. So the second question uh, regarding to the fraction of dark matter is that, uh, yes, we, do, we, are, we don't know how, what's a fraction of dark matter is actually at 130 uh, billion electron volts. But the predicted, uh, based on the observations, we can infer what's a cross-section of dark matter particle, which is actually uh, very close uh, to what theory would predict, I mean, what the theory would favor. So even the dark matter has a relatively small fraction uh, at this energy compared to, I mean, the rest of the whole dark world. It's a, it will be the first time we start to see uh, at least some of the dark matter could, be, has, could have dark particle nature. So that would, would also be a very uh, big step in order to understand the nature of dark matter, I would say. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Mark. Okay. <laughs> Mark, last question. Is this also consistent with the non-observation of dark matter in accelerators? Oh, yes. Yeah, consistent, yes. Uh, a good point, and I'll make a little editorial remark. There are but, uh, several reports of possible dark matter signals or close quasi-signals that have been coming up just in the last year. And in fact, uh, two other reports connected with MIT uh, in relation to this. So I'd like to hope that one of you at least is on the right track <laughs> and that we'll know for sure that one of these signals is dark matter yeah. within the next year or two. That's but, true. Uh, thank you very much, Meng, oh, for an exciting talk. Thank you very much.